Those two scripture texts that we look at that Elizabeth read for us are the ones where we'll spend time today. So if you would, um, just keep your fingers on those two. Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 18. And um, we'll spend a little time in Genesis 2, a little time in Genesis 3, and then we'll go back to 1 Corinthians and we'll finish in a little bit in Ephesians 5. Well, today, if, yes, if last Sunday wasn't controversial enough, preaching on biblical masculinity, maybe we'll try it this Sunday and preach on biblical femininity. Uh, today, we, we seek God's understanding of and God's uh, word in what it means to be a, uh, a woman, what it means to be a woman of God in the midst of uh, in particular our culture and our world, um, what's the same from the beginning of time and what's changed, if anything has changed, and and how do we understand ourselves as um, men and then in particular today as women in in the midst of human beings who are being redeemed, redeemed into Jesus Christ. That's what we seek to understand and in order to understand it as fully as possible, we want to begin at the beginning. So that's why we are in Genesis chapter 2. And I want to start in Genesis 2 verse 18. If you have your Bibles with you, that's page 4 in the Pew Bible, in your own Bible, Genesis 2 18. It says this, the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a, su- a helper suitable for him. Now, before we even get into an understanding of women, we need to understand this verse, that God first created man. That's not, um, uh, that's not a, a slight on Eve. It's nothing bad. It's nothing good. It just is what it is. When God first began to create, he created first Adam. He created first man. And one of the things I want us to understand about the nature of men then is that because man was created first, he experienced something that Eve never did. He experienced, in fact, Adam in particular experienced something that no other person, not even the Lord Jesus Christ himself, ever experienced as a human being, and that is being alone as a human being. He was, at this point in time, the only human on the face of the planet, the only one. Adam was created in his very nature to be in solitude with God. Now, just because he was in solitude with God doesn't mean that that was sufficient for him. In fact, we know from this verse that it wasn't. The Lord looked at Adam and saw him in his solitude, the solitude in which he had created Adam, and he said it's not good that man would be alone. Nonetheless, it's important, especially as we get to, when we eventually get to Eve, that we understand one of the differences between Eve and Adam is that Adam was created in, in solitude. In solitude. In fact, I think we even see this still in the very nature of men today. Um, If you think about, I I think this is a a terrible excuse not to come to church, but you do hear it sometimes. You hear someone that will say to you, you know, I don't go to church because I find my peace with God while I'm out in the woods by myself, or I'm out on the lake fishing. Now, as you're thinking about someone telling you that, in your mind, it's a man, isn't it? Women don't tell you I'm gonna go out in the woods to be by myself or out in the middle of a lake fishing to think about God, do they? And generally, and and there's exceptions to that of course, there are women who enjoy these things, but by and large across the genders, it's men who in their primalness have this solitude with themselves and God that's built in. Is that part of them? Absolutely. Is that sufficient for them? Absolutely not. We see that God looks on the condition of man and says, it's not good that man would be alone. So we continue then to see what's God's remedy? Does God jump right to Eve? Does he say, man's alone, let's make him a woman? That's not what he does. Interestingly enough, look what happens next. Verse 19, now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. Whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock and the birds of the air and the beast of the field, but for Adam there was no no suitable helper found. So God's first play, his first move, as soon as he recognized that it's not good for man to be alone, his first move was to bring all the animals to Adam to see if any of them would work as a suitable helper, and they would not. Now, before Eve is ever even created, this tells us something about women. It tells us that women are not inferior to men. If they were, then they would not be a suitable helper, would they? 
God brought all the animals who were inferior to him to him and says, see if this inferior being will work. See if this inferior being will work. See if this one will work. And again and again, Adam says, no, this one's not like me. No, this one doesn't bear the image of God as I do. No, this one I can't have a, a relationship with. The, the very thing that makes women important and valuable and wonderful is that they, like men, are created in the image of God, equal in the image of God. Now, equal doesn't mean same in every respect, but equal means equal, equal in validity, equal in, in loveliness, equal in, in um, desirability before God, equal in the image of God. So let's see what God does then as, when all the animals weren't sufficient in verse 21. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And then the Lord God made woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this now, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his mother and father, be united to his wife, they'll be one flesh. So one of the things that we see in Eve is that Adam finally found what was missing for himself, for his very nature, in the person of Eve. Now one of the things we'll notice about Eve that's different than Adam from day one, from the very beginning, one of the distinct differences between Adam and Eve is that when Eve was created, she was created immediately in relationship, wasn't she? And that's different than Adam. Adam was created in solitude. Eve was created in a perfect relationship, not just a perfect relationship with God, but she was created in a perfect relationship with Adam. So that in every way she was able to love and honor and respect God and she was loved and honored and cherished by God. Similarly, she was able to love and honor uh, her husband Adam and he was able to love and honor and cherish her as well. Perfect relationship on all accounts between Eve and Adam and God and Eve and Adam. Just this beautiful harmony of relationship. Let me put it this way. Woman was created in her nature to be a being in relationship, wasn't she? She was taken out of man. How much more relational does it get? And I think that as just as we experience solitude at the, in the primal being of men, I think we experience the relationality in the primal being of women. That women are more relational in general than men are. Now again, there are, of course, exceptions. There are men who are extremely relational, and there are uh, women who can live in solitude. But what I mean is across the genders, generally speaking, women tend to be more relationally minded. They have a, more, a, a natural intensity toward relationships that men simply don't. Not that they can't be relational, but that women have a, an advantage in this regard, that they naturally sense things. My wife will tell me all the time, uh, bring to, my, to mind the things that I say and say, I wonder if you thought about the way maybe other people heard that, the way they thought about it. She's thinking relationally about way that, the ways that people receive the things that are said rather than necessarily you know, thinking about it. Or, uh, but she's, she's aware of the relationships. I even see this in um, the, rela- the difference between young boys and girls. I see my, uh, my own girls as they're playing at home, they're always concerned with creating these play situations where there are relationships. Who's gonna be the mom? Who's gonna be the dad? Who's gonna be the kid? And boys, I generally don't see them playing that way, building the relationship aspects of their play. You see how in, built into women at the very core of the primalness of who they are, there's, there's this relational aspect. They were created in relationship from day one. The man was created in solitude. Now he was brought into relationship and he realized that that relationship was good for him, but woman was the one who was created in relationship. It helps us to understand, under, knowing this about men and women, it helps us to understand what happens whenever sin enters in and the fall becomes the reality. And so for that, I want us to go into Genesis chapter three. And there in Genesis three, we're told the story of the fall where Satan comes and tempts uh, Eve and Eve eats the fruit and gives it to Adam and Adam uh, also takes part in it. So uh, the relationship between uh, Adam and God and between Eve and God is broken then. 
And what happens as a result of that broken relationship, that sin that has entered in? Well, in chapter three and verse 18, we're concerned particularly, there are consequences for the man, but we're, we're concerned particularly about the consequences for the woman today. And here's what is said in verse 16. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. So there's two aspects of, of femininity that we see in the consequence of this fall. First of all, as we mentioned, that one aspect of femininity is, I mean, it's just simple biology. Women can have children and men can't. That has to be an aspect of femininity rather than masculinity because it's something that women do and, and men do not do. They do not have children. And women are able to do this, at least theoretically able to have children. Um, and so we, we understand that, that having children is part of what it means to be feminine. But in the fall, when sin enters into this equation, we see that into that process of what it means to be a woman, what it means to be feminine, pain is brought in. Now any woman who's had a child before knows that it is a joyful experience. There is a, a, a wonderfulness about it. There's a, a, a euphoria and a joy to see those children. But any woman who's had a child can also tell you that it's a painful process, isn't it? I think I've told you <laughs> my own story before. When, I, when uh, Brittany was in the hospital giving birth to our firstborn, uh, they hooked this machine up to her that uh, spiked every time she was having a contraction. And I would watch that machine and I'd say, oh look, honey, you're having a contraction. <laughs> She'd say, I know I'm having a contraction. There's pain in, in it, isn't there? There's pain in, in giving birth to children. But not just in the physical aspect of giving birth. Well, first of all, think about what that might have been like before the fall. We don't know because there were no children before, born before that, but there's no pain in it. It was only good, only joy mixed without pain, without death. But now that there's pain brought in, it's not just the pain of actually giving birth. I, I think that there's pain intended throughout the process of childbearing. Um, one would be when you realize that you have given birth uh, yes, to a wonderful little bundle of joy, but it doesn't take very long for you to realize that that wonderful little bundle of joy is also a sinner. <laughs> and, and, and that little child knows from day one how to be selfish, how to, how to um, you know, steal toys as they grow up to be a toddler, how to disobey their parents. They realize, you realize from day one that that child has the same sin nature in you, that, that, that in them that, they ha that you have in you. That there's a, uh, and, and so in raising a child who is naturally rebellious as we are rebellious from God, there's pain in it. Man, it, those teenage years can be really painful. I understand, I haven't experienced it yet, but that's what they tell me. There's pain mixed in raising children. It's not just that, we think about the complications that sometimes come with giving birth, where the mother's life is put into danger or the child's life is put into danger. Uh, and, and sometimes the difficult decisions that have to be made, there's pain in childbirth. We think about women who long to embody this aspect of femininity. They want to have children, and yet, for whatever reason, they can't. There's pain in the process, isn't there? And it's a particular pain that falls, yes, on men, but more so. Women bear the weight of this particular sort of pain, don't they? God is right when he says this, that part of the consequence of the fall is pain in childbearing. And, and it becomes particularly painful for this feminine aspect of, for women. But there's, there's another aspect of femininity that's built into the, the brokenness, the, the curse here. And it says this, that in, uh, in, in the second part of verse 16, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. In order to understand this, I think we have to remember that women are created to be relational. And men initially were created in solitude. Women were initially created in relationships. So there's this perfect harmony between God and, and Eve and Eve and Adam. There's this beautiful, you know, like a, 
like a beautiful working machine, this relationship functions perfectly, but then when God is break, broken out of the equation, Eve all of a sudden finds herself in a situation she's never been in before. She finds herself in a, in a broken relationship where there is something missing. And all of a sudden she realizes that her, the way that she was loved and adored by God has been broken and, and she's not feeling that anymore. So what does she do? Well, then she turns to her husband and says, now that this is broken, I need you to make up the difference. I remember as a child riding on uh, my bike, it's one of my earlier memories, riding on my bike, and uh, it was a bike that had the training wheels still on it, and so I'm very young at this point, and at one point, one of my training wheels fell off. I still didn't know how to ride on two wheels, so I had to ride home on one training wheel. Have you ever seen a child do that? You lean to one side and you're riding on one wheel. And it struck me, oh my goodness, I hope that this wheel holds out. I don't think this training wheel was meant to hold this much pressure for this much time. Here's what happens. When the relationship between Adam, I mean between Eve and God is broken, then Eve leans full scale into her relationship with Adam. She puts the weight, the relational weight that belongs between her and God, she puts that relational weight on Adam. And he can't bear it. He can't bear it. We're thinking of women even today who especially think of a young woman who's maybe looking for a husband. And she's looking for a man who uh, can honor her femininity, who can open doors for her, be chivalrous for her, and yet at the same time give her an equal expectation uh, and who can treat her right and and, uh, lift her up. She's looking for a woman who can satisfy her spiritually, mentally, emotionally, who can be her knight in shining armor, her all in all. His whole world is going to be consumed by her, and he's going to walk on water and turn water into wine. Women are looking for that, aren't they? What they're, what they're looking for though, what they're put, the relational weight that they're putting on, the expectation that they're putting on the man is a weight that doesn't belong to him though, a weight that he can't bear. It's a weight that belongs to God. How many women are, are looking in their husbands to take the place of their savior? Women are looking for God, and they're finding it in their husband, the problem is that husbands make terrible gods, don't they? (laughs) Can't live up to it. And so we see this brokenness, that this woman's desire is going to be for her husband because she desires to have that completeness in her relationship. And I I want us to also notice the the very last part of this, it says, Um, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. There's one aspect in which if you're desiring your husband, then you're giving him all the cards. If you're saying, I want you more than anything else, I want you to be my savior, I want you to be my all in all, and that puts all the cards in his hands, it puts him in the position of calling the shots. So in one respect, we understand where that comes from, but I want us to think not just the individual aspect, think about the societal aspect of what happens here. How, what ends up happening as a result of the fall, right or wrong, is that what men should or shouldn't be doing has become the dominant aspect of every conversation that women have. And, and I, I mean this, whether you're talking about an, ex, a feminist on one extre, an extreme feminist on one end, or you know, just a classical, uh, old-fashioned woman on the other. On the one end, you've got this classical woman who's saying, oh honey, your husband ought to be taking care of you. He ought to be buying you the nice things. He should be opening doors for you and pampering you and, and putting you on a pedestal. You've got the classic woman who is happy to put herself in that very uh, classically effeminate role. And then you've got, the, on the other end of it, you've got the, the feminist who's saying, you know what, I as a woman, you as a man should be treating me equal. You as a man should be giving women more opportunity. And yet what are both of those conversations about? They're about what men should be doing in relationship to women, right? Whether it's right or wrong, that's what the conversation is, what men should be doing or should not be doing. So he will rule over you. He'll be the topic of your conversation one way or the other. I was reminded as I was preparing for this sermon of a a song that Randy Travis, I don't know if you're a Randy Travis fan, I am, I like country music, came out with a song a few years ago, a love song called Forever and Ever. 
Uh, Forever and ever, amen, is the name of the song. And there's a lyric in there that goes like this that I think we can resonate with. Oh baby, I'm gonna love you forever. Forever and ever, amen. As long as old men sit and talk about the weather, as long as old women sit and talk about old men. (laughs) That's it, isn't it? That's it. Rarely do you hear men sitting around talking about, oh, what the women should do. But it's often the case when whether men are doing what they should or should not do, that becomes the topic of conversation, doesn't it? What men should or shouldn't be doing. Part of it is a result of the fall, that this has to be the the topic of our conversation. But nonetheless, what God says here is true. Your desire will be for your husband, and he'll rule over you. Now what we want to understand though is not necessarily just the broken aspects of femininity but the redeemed aspects. How do we, how do we understand what we should be then? Not just what we are as broken uh, men and women but how do, we, how do we push forward into what's real? And for that I want to turn to 1 Corinthians. Um, let me get there and I'll tell you what page it's on. 1 Corinthians in chapter 11. This is on page 1784. 1 Corinthians 11, in verse eight, it says this. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. That's just making reference to the Genesis text, isn't it? That woman was, that a rib was taken out of Adam and woman was created from that rib. That woman was taken out of man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. What this text says in its simplest sense is that woman was created for the man. Now, this brought to mind the Westminster Shorter Catechism for me, which says, what's the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And so in the noblest and the best and the highest sense, this is also true for women, which is why I can say this, that the chief end of woman is to glorify the man and enjoy him forever, but who is the man? The man is Jesus Christ, is he not? That that what women lost in the fall is regained in Christ as they give themselves to glorify him and to enjoy Jesus Christ. That woman was created for the man in Jesus Christ. Really as all, of, as all of us were, but it, but it lands particularly heavy as we understand the, fall, the fallen nature of women, it lands particularly heavy for them, doesn't it? That you, sisters in the faith, you were made for this man who has come to make you whole, to restore those broken parts of your relationship in a way that a husband never could. But Jesus does. Jesus does that. Which is why we can also say now as New Testament Christians that that you as women, um, you say, well, what happens if I never get married to a man? Well, that's okay. As long as the man that you are in and that you are uh, committed to and, and wrapped up in is the person of Jesus Christ, he will never let you down in a way that a sinful and broken man will let you down. And all of these men are sinful and broken, but he is not. Now, is Paul talking here about Jesus only? I don't think so. I think he is talking about real life relationships, about the way that women relate to actual, uh, well, Jesus is an actual man. Let me be clear about that. He is an actual man. He is a, a human being and he is also fully God. But what I mean is men who are not Jesus. <laughs> How do women relate to men who are not Jesus? Does this apply to them too, that they are to live for, uh, that they are to be for these men? And I think the answer is a qualified yes. Yes women to live in and for these men in so far as their path is a path that honors God. If they are uh, men who honor and walk toward and follow in the Lord Jesus Christ, then here's the thing, if you're a woman who honors and walks in and follows the Lord Jesus Christ, you're headed the same direction. It's, it's, It's no difficulty to follow a man like that because his path is the same as yours. Now, does that mean that you follow a man in every sort of sinful and broken way he might lead you astray? No, absolutely not. 
Absolutely not. Only insofar as he is in obedience to Christ. We read continuing then in in verses 11 and 12. I mean 10 through 12. For this reason and because of the angels, the woman ought to have a sign of authority on her head. Now that has to do with the larger context of this verse. Um, You know, maybe another sermon we can talk about head coverings, but this really refers to something larger here. In verse 11, in the Lord, however, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman, but everything comes from God. What this teaches us is that a a society without the influence of women is an awful society. (laughs) That we need women. Otherwise, we get back to that same condition Adam was first in, isn't it? It's a a loneliness. It's it's an emptiness. It's a solitude that that ultimately doesn't sustain us. It's It's only in a society with both men and women that we find our fullness as human beings. So as we look to society, we recognize that women are that women come from man originally, that's the Genesis, but that every man since then has been born from a woman, has he not? And how many of us would, would say that our moms had profound influence on the people that we become today as men and women? Of course. Maybe the most influential person in most of our lives has been our mother, hasn't it? Oh, how moms have shaped our society. Let's be honest that that women are the glue that holds our society together on the family level, the church level, and the society level. Let me give you an example. When I got dropped off at college by my parents for the first time, when my my parents were leaving, my father had one last word with me, and his word was not, son, make sure you call me. His word was, son, make sure you call your mother. (laughs) It's important, isn't it, to call your mom. She's the relational glue that holds the family together. We will have a meeting after church today. It'll be those who are interested in caring for the church and holding the church together. And I don't know for sure, but if I had to take a guess, I bet it'll be a room filled with women. It'll be the women who hold this church together, won't it? It'll be women that hold our society together, but it's not just holding society together, it's also making society beautiful. First of all, on just the purely physical level, let's be honest, guys, women are the more beautiful of the genders, aren't they? They are, they're just more beautiful. And and not only are they themselves beautiful, they make everything beautiful. They are the things that, 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 that makes life worth opening your eyes for in the morning, to see the beauty of the day. And women are creative. Women are creative not only in their bodies, but in their minds, in their natures. They are creative beings. And so we need these women because men come from women and our best natures are only found in in the, the working together of men and women. But as we close today, I want us to consider the gospel. And I want us to consider what Paul writes to Ephesians. I'll read you two verses. You don't have to turn there unless you want to, you can. Ephesians 5.22 says this, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. But then after he explains this further, he finishes down in Ephesians 5.32 by saying this, This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. That ultimately every male-female relationship, whether it's husband and wife or um, or pastor and parishioner, or teacher and student, whatever, whatever way husbands, uh, whatever way men and women interact with each other, there's always this dynamic going on that, 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 that both need each other. Just as, a, just as Christ and the church. He says, this is a great mystery, and I'm referring to Christ and the church. And so if we're gonna understand women rightly, we have to understand the way that, Christ, that God sees the church. How does God see the church, friends? Well, God gave his only beloved son to die so that he could redeem the church that he loves. Nothing, nothing is more important to God than his church. It is the centerpiece of all his work of creation. It is the centerpiece of all his work of redemption. It is beautiful and glorious and holy to him. And nothing will separate him from the church that he loves. It is his 
world, his centerpiece, his victory, his joy. And so as we consider women in our society, it is not enough to simply say, oh yeah, there's men and there's also women. If we get anywhere close to that, we have missed the mark. We as a society, as a church, should be putting women, as Christ does the church, at the centerpiece of his affections and saying, women are the thing that, that, we, that we love, that we cherish, that we honor, that we lift up, that we enjoy, that we delight in, because God delights in that way in his church. And I'll tell you this, as we come to the end of the sermon today, I, I invite you to consider yourself, whether you're a man or a woman, if you have felt that completeness of relationship, that you've felt honored and beloved and cherished and redeemed and washed and holy, Christ came for these reasons, to make you this beloved bride, both men and women. Sometimes in the scriptures, when we read Paul's letters, he addresses the whole church and he says, brothers. And so sometimes, women, you have to be brothers. But sometimes he refers to the church as bride. And so sometimes, men, you have to understand, we get to be bride. We're the bride of the church. Did you know that you are the centerpiece of God's affection? That he couldn't love you more? What more could he do than send his own son to shed his own blood? to redeem you, to cherish you, to build a relationship that was lost back into you. Thank God for the bride, the church, and for the femininity that she embodies and the way that we see that witnessed in holy women among us. May this word be to the glory of God and for the joy of his people. Amen.